literature has the power to transport us to magical realms, to ignite our imagination, and introduce us to unforgettable characters. Obviously, it's my favorite genre of all time. I, I can't get enough of it. And today, we're going to be delving into some captivating fantasy worlds uh, through the lens of my top 10 fantasy series of all time. Or at least of 2023. Yes, I did make this video last year. It actually ended up being the best performing video on my channel. So thank you. Uh, and in that video, I actually mentioned that I want to make this an annual thing. So that's what we're doing today. This is going to be my updated 2023 fantasy series of all time. As I continue to read more books, my favorites are always going to be changing, uh, but all the books that I mentioned in last year's video are still some of my favorites, and you're going to see some of them return in this video, but I've also read a lot of new books that are fresh in my memory, and I want to give them some time in the spotlight so that you guys might be introduced to some new series that you haven't read yet. There is still so many series that I wish I could put on this list. You know, I could only choose 10 of them, so if you have some series I didn't mention, feel free to let me know in the comments some of your favorite fantasy books of all time. Tell me why I'm a fool for not putting them in this video. Anyway, sit back, grab a snack, maybe a bowl of cereal or something. Oh, that reminds me. This video is sponsored by Magic Spoon. Are you tired of the same old boring breakfast options? Mm -hmm. Do you want a cereal that's not only delicious, but fueling and high quality? Mm -hmm. Introducing Magic Spoon. Magic Spoon is not your average cereal. It's a cereal revolution. Revolution. Their variety pack comes with four delicious flavors. Cocoa, frosted, fruity, and peanut butter. My favorite is probably the frosted. It tastes so good. Now Magic Spoon is made with real wholesome ingredients and it has zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and four to five net grams of carbs in each serving. Only 140 calories per serving and they're also keto friendly, gluten free, grain free, and soy free. So I have been eating this cereal for the past week now. Honestly, I'm loving it. And growing up, you know, cereal is one of the best parts of being a kid. Now that I'm an adult, I've been trying to cut down on sugar because it zaps my energy. I've also been eating gluten-free and Magic Spoon has that vibrant color that my brain loves and it has that mouth-watering taste that my taste buds love, but it has high protein goodness that fuels my day. Click the link below to grab a variety pack and try it today. Make sure you use the promo code captured in words at checkout to get $5 off any order, or you can go to Magic Spoon Spoon.com slash captured in words. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, they're backed by a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason at all, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. So use the link below or scan the QR code up above and use the code captured in words to save $5. Or go to magicspoon.com slash captured in words to save that $5. And a big thank you to Magic Spoon for sponsoring the video. First off, we have some honorable mentions. Recently, I started Malazan Book of the Fallen and I really enjoyed Book one, I still don't really know what's going on, but I'm really enjoying it. It is an amazingly complex and philosophical and dark and epic story, and I know as soon as I read more into this series, it's likely gonna have a spot on my top 10 list. And the same goes for A Song of Ice and Fire. Yes, I am not caught up with this series. I haven't, I haven't read all the books that are released as of yet. I think it's safe to say I have some time to get caught up, so I'm not exactly in a rush, but I do really enjoy this series. It's just, I haven't read far enough to put it in my top 10. Next up, we have The Legend of Drist books by R.A. Salvatore. This is my a bind up collection of the Dark Elf trilogy. I had this ever since like middle school, and this series actually got me back into reading fantasy and reading in general. When I was in middle school and high school and I thought I was too cool to read, uh, this series made me realize that no, I'm not cool. I'm a fantasy nerd. Drist has so much relatability to him. He is such a deep and complex character, uh, and I love hearing his musings and, and all of his inner thoughts and turmoil. I felt like I was growing up with this character, and honestly, I really want to return to the, leg to the Legend of Drist series uh, and read them again sometime. Do you say Drist? Drizzed? 
Drizzit. Another honorable mention is The Dragon Riders of Pern by Anne McCaffrey. This is a classic sci-fi fantasy. I, I love how there's so much sci-fi aspects in this series. Uh, and really, it is, it's a classic that gets overlooked a lot nowadays. I don't really see many modern readers reading The Dragon Riders of Pern. But its influence has been seen all throughout the fantasy genre, and I think it deserves a lot more attention. The Dresden Files by Jim Butcher deserves a mention. I'm making my way through this series right now, I'm just on book four, and I hear that it progressively gets better and better, which I'm excited about because I'm already enjoying it. Uh, so yeah, this is, again, this will likely be on a top ten list in the future. The Belgariad by David Eddings. Now this is classic fantasy at its finest. I think if you are okay with a lot of, you know, classic fantasy tropes, you just want something that's cozy. It will just wrap you up in a warm fantasy blanket. This is it. I mean, it has, you know, the farm boy to hero trope and a lot of classic fantasy tropes. I mean, I don't really like seeing those tropes in modern fantasy, but every once in a while, I just want to go back to some of the classics and they just feel so cozy. And this, again, this is one of the best classic fantasies. I feel like the characters are really memorable and lovable, and there's just some really great scenes in this in this series. One of you guys sent me this book, actually, so thank you so much for sending me the book. I feel bad that I haven't really made any videos on the Belgariad, but I'll have to change that in the future. Okay, now hear me out. I am not putting the King Killer Chronicle on my list this year. <laughs> I know. If you know my channel, you already know that this unfinished series means a lot to me. I've made a ton of videos on it, uh, which, by the way, yes, I'm working on part two for my in-depth summary of The Wise Man's Fear. I'm hoping to get that up soon. But yeah, it was very influential in my love for fantasy. It's always going to be a favorite of mine. Lately, I do have just, you know, a little bit of disappointment in Rothfuss, just with certain things that have gone on, uh, but I just decided not to put it on the list this year, because you guys already know that I like this series. I don't need to, I don't need to put it in my top 10. Also, just getting an honorable mention is the Farseer Trilogy by Robin Hobb. You guys know that I love this trilogy as well. Fit Chivalry, Night Eyes, and The Fool, they're always going to be a part of me. It's one of my favorite series, uh, but I just want to bring attention to some other series this time. Senlin Ascends, and all the Books of Babel is it's such an underrated fantasy series. I would highly recommend it. Tress of the Emerald Sea by Brandon Sanderson is one of my favorite books that I read this year. It almost got its spot on this list, but I decided to just give it an honorable mention. Another one of my absolute favorites is the Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn series by Tad Williams. I just have the first two in these editions, uh, but the world of Austin Art, this lush, amazingly detailed and complex world is always going to be one of my favorites and the story it took me a while to get into the book i am glad i did not quit because it ended up being one of my favorites the old kingdom series by garth nix sabriel is one of my favorite books of all time it has one of the best animal companions of all time as well if you love that trope like i do then you then you owe it to yourself to read the old kingdom in my opinion this is young adult fantasy at its finest moving on to my top 10 and first up is is Piranesi by Susanna Clark. This was a recent read for me, and it's already earned its spot in my favorites. I already knew from reading the synopsis that I would likely enjoy this book because I love just weird, dreamy, and imaginative stories. And this is a really great example of magical realism. In this book, we're introduced to this labyrinth-like world known as The House, where our solitary inhabitant, Piranesi, navigates mysterious halls filled with statues and an ever-changing ocean. As secrets unravel, Piranesi's understanding of his own existence and the truth of the world around him is tested. The house itself becomes a character. It feels alive and mysterious with its ever-changing tides. It has a sense of both beauty and foreboding. Now, Piranesi has this childlike wonder of the world around him. Uh, he seems to just have this dedication to the house, but also this yearning to discover more and to, to investigate every little thing that appears. Overall, Piranesi is a beautifully written and thought-provoking book. Clark has some incredible prose and the atmosphere of wonder and mystery and the exploration of human nature makes this like a master class of fantasy literature. Next up, we have The Murderbot Diaries by Martha Wells. I have really loved my time with The Murderbot Diaries. I still need to read some of the full-length novels. The series follows a rogue security android, dubbed Murderbot, who happens to enjoy watching a good soap opera. He's relatable and extraordinary. Now, Murderbot navigates a futuristic world filled with corporate conspiracies and sentient AI. 
Murderbot, with its sarcastic wit and its internal struggle for identity and independence, uh, it, it captured my heart as it grew from this detached machine to a complex and compassionate being. The pacing of these novellas is top-notch. Each of them is kind of a standalone that then ties into a larger arc. It's a perfect mix of action, humor, and introspection. There's these times where Martha Wells has intense action, and then there's some quieter moments where it's more focused on the introspection. And I think it's just such an effortless and seamless transition. You can tell that Martha Wells is a really talented writer. The Book of the New Sun by Gene Wolfe. This is a science fiction fantasy series uh, that's one numerous awards. It has a lot of literary value to it, and it has a very dedicated following. But still, I don't think there's enough people that have heard of this series or have read this series because it is so good. It takes place in a far future Earth uh, where the sun is dying, and this results in a decaying and dying world. The story follows Severian, a young man who's an apprentice in the Guild of Torturers, and he possesses a unique ability to recall his memories with exceptional detail. He's eventually exiled from the Guild, and he embarks on a journey through a vividly depicted world that's filled with strange landscapes, bizarre creatures, and complex societies. He gets into entangled in political intrigues and mystical occurrences. The narrative seamlessly weaves together elements of science fiction and fantasy and mythology, creating this richly layered and ambiguous story. This is a series that's known for its intricate prose, its dense symbolism, and its philosophical undertones. It also has this unreliable narrator that I think is just fantastic. Next we have Tigana by Guy Gavriel K. This is the best fantasy standalone book that I have read. It is a beautiful literary fantasy that I really think doesn't get talked about enough. I know this is, you know, one of his best books of all time, but I still don't see enough people talking about it. A lot of the themes and the character development feels like something you'd see in more modern fantasy. It, it feels way ahead of its time. Kay's prose is nothing short of incredible. He is known for his lyrical prose and his complex characters, but another thing that he does really, really well is he builds these new fantasy worlds that they're not your typical Tolkien-esque fantasy. Uh, it, it feels very fresh, but also really familiar. He, he draws a lot of inspiration from the Byzantine Empire and Renaissance Italy. And in many ways, it feels less fantasy and more historical fiction. I would say the fantasy aspects of Tagana are more toned down than other fantasy works. Uh, and that's something I thought I would have a problem with. I love a lot of magic and fantasy in my fantasy books, but I had no problem whatsoever because this book, this book is incredible. I don't know what else to say. It's highly regarded as Kay's finest work and it's considered a classic by many, and I can see why. But again, it's also underrated. There needs to be more people talking about it. One reason I love Tagana is that it's a standalone, and you don't often see a lot of fantasy standalones. Oftentimes, fantasy books are these huge, massive tombs that's a super long series that's long and drawn out. And yes, I do enjoy my long fantasy series as well, but sometimes I just want to read a standalone. And this is one of the best standalones you could ever ask for. Speaking of which, I do really want to read more fantasy standalones, so let me know your recommendations. Next up, we have the Elric Saga. Penned by the legendary author Michael Moorcock, the grandfather of grimdark fantasy, the Elric Saga introduces us to Elric of Melnibane, a brooding and tormented anti-hero. He's a melancholic sorcerer king wielding a soul-devouring sword named Stormbringer. Intrigued? Yeah, I thought so. The Elric Saga has had a huge influence on the fantasy genre. It's inspired characters like the Witcher, Geralt of Rivia, Vasher, and Nightblood from Warbreaker. Elric even inspired the creator of Dungeons and Dragons. Moorcock is also credited with coining the term multiverse, a notion which is used currently by both Marvel and DC. If you don't know, there's an entire multiverse out there of Moorcock's fiction, including tons of crossovers and references, which is bound to get any fan of the Cosmere excited. And the adventures of this sickly albino emperor with a soul-drinking sword that's sentient was leagues away from the usual heroic fantasy of Tolkien and other fantasy authors of its time. If you've been interested in reading the Elric Saga, I think the best way to read it is with these brand new bind-up editions. Uh, this is volume one, and this has 
the first four books of the El Elric saga within it. It also has a ton of artwork and even a reading guide at the back. Uh, I think it's the best way to get into the Elric saga. I, I read some Elric books years and years ago, and I kind of forgot a lot about it, but now I'm reading it again with these editions, and I'm loving it. He knows how to write atmospheric fantasy. It's weird and creepy and kind of trippy and extremely imaginative, and despite some of its flaws, the Elric Saga is an incredible piece of fiction. Le Guin is a legend, and Earthsea is a stellar fantasy. What sets the Earthsea cycle apart is Le Guin's unparalleled mastery of language, and her ability to craft a world that feels both vividly real and deeply magical. Her prose flows like poetry, painting vibrant landscapes and breathing life into unforgettable characters. Le Guin's mastery of storytelling is evident in the very first pages of A Wizard of Earthsea. She manages to bring so much wonder to the archipelago of Earthsea in her vivid descriptions and elegant prose. This is a world that's teeming with vibrant mystical islands, vast oceans, ancient traditions, and a rich tapestry of cultures. Through the character of Ged, who's training to be a wizard and who undergoes a journey of profound self-discovery and self-mastery, we witness struggles and triumphs and inner conflicts uh, that all define the human experience. As Ged needs needs to face his enemy, he also needs to face himself. When we first meet Ged, he's wild and proud, and then he makes a terrible mistake and he's not powerful enough to deal with it. And once he's grown up a bit, we see him trying to fix this terrible mistake that he made. That is a very, very simple way to explain the story. Now, I'm positive you've at least heard of the Earthsea books by Ursula K. Le Guin. They are a classic, and I can't recommend them enough. Now, I have this beautiful illustrated bind-up edition of all the books of Earthsea, and I highly recommend this edition because it is, it's a prized possession on my shelf. It's just so beautiful. Now, I find it really sad that a lot of readers likely aren't going to give Earthsea a chance just because it's young adult fantasy. Just please, don't be a book snob because the themes are deep and mature, and really, y young adult books do not have to shy away from mature themes. I feel like this is a series you can read to your kids, but you can also learn a lot from it as well. It touches on a lot of thought-provoking stuff, it has a ton of literary value, and I feel like any age can enjoy it. So many modern readers have not read it, and it deserves to be read. At number four is a series I'm enjoying more and more, and that is Discworld. This is a brilliantly crafted series by the legendary Terry Pratchett, with over 40 books to its name. It's a vast and sprawling world that's filled to the brim with whimsy, wit, and a healthy dose of satire. From the iconic bumbling wizard Rincewind to the fierce and determined Commander Vimes of the City Watch. Each character in Discworld is a gem in their own right. Pratchett's deep understanding of human nature shines through in his characterizations. Granny Weatherwax, the librarian, Death, the sheer diversity and depth of the characters is fantastic. Now, the satire in these books mirrors our own world in the most cunning and clever ways. Pratchett weaves in social commentary into his stories, and whether he's tackling inequality, bureaucracy, or just the absurdities of modern life, he does it with a sharp wit that leaves you laughing but also contemplating long after you've turned the final page. Discworld is basically a masterclass in using humor to explore deeper truths about the human condition. I've never read anything that's so hilarious, but also has these profound philosophical moments. Also, we can't forget the sheer versatility of Discworld. You want a rollicking adventure with trolls and dwarves? You got it. Craving a mystery set in the bustling city of Ankh Morpork? Pratchett has you covered. The City Watch books have become my favorite. I've read quite a few Discworld novels now, and I think those are one of the best places to start with Discworld. Joe Abercrombie's first law books have earned their place in my top three, and they're likely going to be cemented there for a long time. Abercrombie's writing is a masterclass in character-driven storytelling. From the moment you delve into the pages of the blade itself, you're going to encounter a cast of characters that are so vividly drawn and so flawlessly flawed that they leap off the pages and into your very own psyche. Each character has so much depth and complexity that captures the essence of human nature. Nature, as they grapple with their own desires, moral ambiguities, and personal demons. 
The first law offers a refreshing take on the conventions of fantasy. Abercrombie subverts traditional tropes and embraces the grittiness and moral ambiguity that lie at the heart of his narrative. Now gone are heroes and clear-cut villains, instead we're presented with characters who embody a spectrum of shades between good and evil. It's in this gray area that Abercrombie excels challenging our preconceived notions and forcing us to question the nature of heroism, sacrifice, and the consequences of our choices. But I also love that these aren't overly grim and pessimistic. There's a lot of humor as well as light moments, and I really like to see this mix in grimdark fantasy. The intricate politics, rivalries, and power struggles between nations and factions adds a layer of depth to the narrative and the world building, and it creates a world that feels both familiar but also really refreshing and original. But overall, these books are very character-driven. There's some really just fantastic and clever dialogue, and these characters are going to stick with you. Now, the first Lost series really explores some themes that resonate deeply within us. Abercrombie delves into the darker aspects of humanity, shining a light on themes of power, vengeance, redemption, and the elusive nature of truth. And with unflinching honesty, he exposes the flaws and frailties of his characters, painting a raw and authentic portrait of the human condition. And it's within this exploration of the human psyche that Abercrombie's writing truly shines. Challenging the reader to confront your own biases, prejudices, and the complexities that lie within yourself. Now, now, since making last year's video, I've gone on and read most of the first law books, including the Age of Madness uh, series, which comes after uh, the First Law trilogy and all the First Law standalones. And yeah, this series is great as well. The way that Abercrombie handles character voice is incredible. They all feel very unique from one another. Uh, now, this is a series that I would highly recommend actually listening to the audiobook versions of over reading the actual physical books. The reason being that Stephen Pacey, the narrator, does such an incredible job uh, translating Abercrombie's character voice. Now, I would even say if you typically don't like Grimdark, I would still give these books a chance because I think Abercrombie can win you over with the first law. Now at number two, I was going to put all of Brandon Sanderson's entire Cosmere universe, but I decided to narrow it down to my favorite Cosmere series, and that is the Stormlight Archive. This is one of my favorite series that's currently being written. I do feel like book four, though I enjoyed it, it was a bit of a drag at times, but I am confident that Stormlight is going to pick up again, and I am here for every moment of it. The Stormlight Archive is a sprawling, epic fantasy that has new Numerous interwoven plots, intricate plot twists, and it takes world building to a whole new level. The series is set in the vibrant and expansive world of Roshar, with its unique ecosystems, its history that's filled with secrets and mysteries, its really neat little spirit-like creatures called Spren, and its intricate magic systems that are begging for some type of video game adaptation. Everything from the Shattered Plains, where you'll find large crustacean chasm fiends, to the island-sized great shells of the Reshi Isles. This is by far up there as one of my favorite fantasy worlds. It's just so alien and imaginative. Now, each character is compelling and multi-dimensional, and Sanderson has this incredible knack for creating protagonists who are flawed. Which, by the way, I just posted a video on how to write character flaws. And in that one, I talk about some of the characters from the Mistborn books, but Stormlight has some brilliantly flawed characters as well. Many of which have these amazing character arcs where they undergo some profound personal growth, and Sanderson loves to delve into their backgrounds, their inner struggles, and personal Personal journeys, allowing readers to form deep connections with them. And this is the one series I can think of where there's so many moments where you literally want to stand up and cheer or pump your fist in the air because the characters just did something incredibly awesome. Sanderson knows how to build up to those moments, and even if it does take some time, he can deliver those emotionally intense scenes that give you goosebumps. Now, people suffering from and coping with mental illness is an important part of the Stormlight Archive, and these characters go through a lot of trauma. For example, there's Kaladin, who's trying to cope with his battle shock and post-traumatic stress disorder. 
The way that Sanderson handles this is one of my favorite parts of the series up until the fourth book, where I do feel like it's starting to feel a bit more forced and not as natural. I don't really know how to explain it, but I'm hoping that he'll handle this better in book five. He touches on a lot of deep themes and provides some really thought-provoking passages, but it's also got some great action and a quick pace that isn't dragged down by excessive description or exposition. Now, in last year's video, I put Tolkien's Middle Earth as number one, and yes, it does deserve that spot. Really, it's on a whole different level. Tolkien is the grandfather of fantasy, and I think a lot of people truly do not realize what an incredible feat Middle Earth is. However, and this will likely be controversial, but there's one series I've enjoyed even more than Tolkien's masterpiece, despite it being more flawed. One series that I believe took what Tolkien started and expanded upon it to become one of the greatest fantasy series of all time, and that is The Wheel of Time by Robert Jordan, and finished by Brandon Sanderson. Sure, you can argue the pacing of the series isn't consistent, or that Jordan has too many repetitive phrases or long, drawn-out descriptions. That doesn't change the fact that this is an incredibly immersive world. The world-building is so well-crafted, and compared to The Lord of the Rings, it shares a similar scope and scale with intricate storylines, diverse characters, and complex political and social dynamics. It has a wide range of races and cultures, each with their own distinct histories, languages, and customs. And it delves deeply into character development, presenting a large ensemble cast with their unique arcs, motivations, and growth. In my opinion, Rand's character arc is one of the most compelling and dynamic in the entire fantasy genre. Maybe you disagree, let me know, but I feel content placing this in my number one. Also, it's a good time to announce that in the next couple months, I'll be working on some in-depth summaries for The Wheel of Time. And those are my top 10 fantasy books of 2023. Keep in mind, this is just my list. If I didn't mention your favorite series, it's okay. Let me know in the comments what your top 10 fantasy books are, uh, and if you have any recommendations. Now, if you are looking for an amazing community of readers and fellow fantasy fans, then make sure to go check out my Discord server. We have a rapidly expanding server that's just a really friendly and welcoming community of amazing people, and you should be a part of it. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and a huge thank you to all of my patrons. You guys make these videos possible. I appreciate the support so much.